So that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. There we have it. So, we're going to read it in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, Jesus, and in the name of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And the Scripture says unto us, and we read, And He gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers. God is wonderful. Hallelujah. My soul exalts you, Lord, for you are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Well, beloved brethren, we're looking at a second part, second part of the study of the prophets. Praise be the Lord. Because when we are looking at the study of the prophets, brethren, we've already seen quite a, quite a fair bit, but we're just going to finish up that part today, which I'm hoping that is, it will be able to be finished, and then we'll only have one to go. So we've already seen the ministry of what it is to be a teacher. We've seen the ministry of what it is to be a pastor and an evangelist. And we've started seeing the one about the prophet. Praise be the Lord. And so now we are here at the ministry of the prophet. Praise the Lord. So, beloved brethren, what we're going to talk about today is this. We need to understand something where we left off from. We're now going to talk about the character, the obligation, the desire, the ability of the prophet, which allows them to understand. You see, somebody who has the gift of a ministry of a prophet within the church means that they've got the gift of prophecy. And not just that they have a gift of prophecy, but it is something that God allows them to move more freely than other people, than other believers in that gift. Because the Bible also, we've seen it in, in, in the previous study, the Bible shows us that the gift of prophecy any believer can have. God can choose to use any Christian believer who has the Spirit of God. God can choose to use anyone at any given time. Now that comes from God. It doesn't come from my mind. It doesn't come from my thoughts or what I imagine that God is trying to say. No. I'm talking about the genuine flow of the Holy Spirit where God will go and give a word and it is a word in prophecy. Why? Because it covers three main areas. And those three main areas is either for edification or for exhortation or for comfort. And that is what the scripture shows us, that the main areas of the prophecy have come to do in the era of the church. In other words, in the time of the New Testament or the time of grace, which we are living in now. Praise be the name of Jesus. But in saying this, brethren, God also raises up those who have a gift of the ministry. He has given them a ministry because the ministry means that they minister to other people and they do it frequently. And when God uses someone in that ministry, well, that person has what's called the ministry of a prophet. And it just means that God will use them more frequently in that gift. And they have that discerned gift more in use. Praise be the name of the Lord. So do these things still exist? Yes, they do. Let's go look at some scripture, brethren. When we look at what the characteristic, the obligation, the desire... Of the prophet would have what would be the characteristic that God places in them because you have to remember that when God gives a gift of the Spirit to someone it's because God has already dealt with that person God is already working in that person God has already started changing and molding that person's character you know to be less of themselves to be more like Christ but there will be specific characteristics that someone that moves frequently in the gift of prophecy that they will have in that ministry and that will be the zeal for the purity in the church. Like, for example, they will not be able to stand seeing worldly things entering into the church. They will not be able to stand, you know, things going off track from the Word of God and from the flowing of the Holy Spirit because God gives them such a zeal of the Spirit and such a, um, you could say that in their spirit, they have such a, um, what's the word I'm trying to look for? There's a, there's, a, there's a beautiful word for this one, which is called... They have a sensibility in the spirit. They are very sensible in the spirit to know that there's something that is affecting the spirit of God's flow. 
there is something in the spirit that tells him that there is something that God is not happy with and more in that area. And when, when you feel that, you start to get this sort of zeal and you sort of say, how is it possible that we can come with such disrespect to the house of the Lord? So there's a zeal here yeah, in the Lord. doesn't mean that the person will go up and start fighting with somebody else, no. But it is something that they feel and they have a sensibility in their spirit because they have something special that God has given to them to connect to the Lord. Let's look at John chapter 17, verse 15 to 17. Praise the Lord. It says, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. In verse 17, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So this is a characteristic that we start to see in somebody who specifically also has um, the gift of, they've got the, the, the ministry of, of prophet because they have such a sensibility. They know the scripture because they spend a lot of time in the scripture. They also spend a lot of time in prayer. They also spend a lot of time in having experiences with the Spirit of the Lord. So they know all of a sudden, you know, you know, many times people don't say anything because, you know, of courtesy. But sometimes, you know, you'll walk into a place and you feel that the Lord is not happy there. Sometimes you'll walk into a place and you'll feel that God is disgusted with those people there. And for prudence sake, we don't say anything. We just say, my Lord, have mercy. And we pray, which is what we are called to do. But then if the, the Spirit of the Lord stirs up that person and says, this person, and starts to reveal this, 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 then we know that God is saying, go and speak to that person and declare to them their sin and bring it out into the surface. Whether they deny it or not, that's up to them. But it is God that brings the things to the surface through the gift of prophecy. And that is usually what happens in someone who has the ministry of a prophet. Because they have a, a life that is constantly being sanctified in the Lord. And that is a zeal that is putting them through the Lord. Let's look at another biblical verse. Another biblical verse is when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 9 to 11. When we look here at this scripture, it says to us, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, these shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So when, whenever there is something like this that's moving within you know, the church, and we're talking about within brethren, yeah? We're talking about within brethren because the world is the world. We know that the world is plunged in sin and darkness. We know that there can be visitors that are from the world, but we're talking directly, God is talking directly with those who call themselves Christian, those who call themselves brother, sister in Christ. That's what the word is referring to here. That these things are no longer to be found in us as Christians. Because for one, a person who practices those things does not have eternal life, is not going to get into the kingdom of God. But at the same time, when you have somebody who's got the spirit of you know, the Lord in them, and they've got this gift of prophecy, they're going to have this seal. That if there is somebody that's practicing these things, yes, they're going to be praying for them. But at the same time, they won't be able to stand so that they'll be able to go and speak to them in a calm manner, in a nice manner. But at the same time, it's because the Spirit of the Lord is moving them to do this. Not because they just hate sin, but it's because the Spirit of God moves them to try and cause the other person who is in sin to come to the truth. You know, to fix their life before the Lord. Because that's what God's plan is for all of us. To restore our life unto God. To give us salvation and eternal life. That's the free gift that God gives. And He wants to see us to the end. Another part 
we see is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 25. What are we going to also see in someone who has the ministry of a prophet? We're going to see them flow in the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is another word for patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, which is another word for humbleness, temperance is another word for self-control. Against such there is no law. So we're going to see that someone who has this ministry, it is because God has already dealt with their characteristics. Because remember, when we all come to Jesus, we've all got the lion within us. We've all got that tiger within us, that anybody who says anything would bite their head off and all that sort of stuff. So yes, we know where we've all come from. But at the same time, God has changed us. God has shaped us to make us more like Christ Jesus and less of ourselves. And all glory be to His name. Hallelujah. And so that's why we see that somebody who's then given this gift, they are flowing in this. They have the zeal to see this, not just in themselves, but in all the other brethren as well. And this is the struggle. This is the battle within a church that someone with the gift of the, the, sort of the ministry of prophet has. They have a zeal that want to see the church move in the fruit of the Spirit. Every single one that says they're Christian, they want them to, to see them move in the fruit of the Spirit. Alright? So now, let's look at the profound sensibility of evil. Because someone who has the ministry of prophet also has a deep connection with the Lord, receives from the Lord, and has a profound sensibility of evil. In other words, sometimes that can be, you know, somebody hasn't even walked in the door and God's already given them bell signs going off. Going up, something's coming in. And they know something's coming into the church. And guess what? Then it comes to the church, but they've already prayed for the church. Because that's what God sounds the alarm for. And so many times these things people don't know about. Only God and the person who receives it. Unless God wants it to be made manifest. And so therefore, someone with the profound sensibility of evil, they also have an ability to identify, define, to, to define, and also they have a strong, you could say, hate for injustice. When they see injustices happen between brethren, they really don't like to see that. Because God is righteous. God is about justice. So when injustice is done, especially between brethren, it really affects them. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Praise be the name of Jesus. In Romans 12, 9 it says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that, abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. So someone who has this ministry of prophet also has this characteristic. It's just there because God has placed it there. It's part of the, the things that God prepares in them. And they need to be shaped in their mind and in their heart this way. Because it's not an easy ministry. You know, when God reveals something to them and wants them to go and say it to the person personally, it's not an easy thing. Sometimes you'll have people who humble themselves and they'll accept it and say, yes, it's true. But then sometimes you'll have people who deny it. They'll deny it. And they won't be humble to the Lord's voice. So, often not, who do you think they take it out on? Because they can't take it out on God. So who do you think is the next best shot? The person standing right in front of them. So it's not an easy thing for them to be having the ministry of the prophet. But at the same time, when we also look at another scripture, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9. Let's have a look there. In Hebrews 1 9, you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus has loved righteousness, but he hates iniquity. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. So he's our example. 
You know why Christians uh, abhor evil? Because we've been given the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God does not like what is evil. So therefore, His children also do not like what is evil. Makes sense, doesn't it? If I did not have the Spirit of God, then I would love what is evil. I would dwell in what is evil. I would rejoice in what is evil. But because I have the Spirit of the living God dwelling in me, I abhor evil. I hate what is sin. And that is the power of the Spirit of God. And this is why the world who does not know the Spirit of God hates you and me. Because they do not know Jesus. They do not know His Spirit. And they do not know that He has only come to do them good rather than bad. Because the evil only ends up killing them off anyways. They only end up in despair and pain and suffering and all those sorts of things anyways. Destroying their bodies and rewarded at the end with hell. But that's because many of them don't know Jesus. They don't know the Spirit of the living God. But let's move on. The precise comprehension of danger of false teachings. So somebody who has the gift of, of prophet as well, because remember I told you that they are people who have a, brief, a strong prayer life. They are people who also have a strong life in the Word. They know doctrine. They go hand in hand with the Word and with doctrine. Sorry, with prayer and with doctrine. With prayer and with the Word. And so this is why whenever they hear something that is preached or taught in a pulpit, they're able to understand. You know, we'll go a step further actually. We'll go a step further actually. You know what also happens? Sometimes there are people that they have such a sensibility in spirit that they'll be able to even sense and feel when that preaching is coming in the spirit or if it's flowing in the flesh. And that happens as well. That when somebody is preaching or teaching, they will be able to sense within their spirit that that is either coming from the Lord or it's not coming from the Lord. That it's coming from the person. It's coming from the flesh. But when it's coming from the spirit, they will also be able to know that it's coming from the spirit of God. This is part of being sensible. But also at the same time, if it is a false teaching that is being given, they will also be able to know and identify it because they know scripture. And the Spirit of God will also be helping them, you know, to identify that. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. Because we have to know this, brethren. God placed this ministry of prophet because of what we're going to look at. God knew what was going to come. And it's the times we're living in. And even the apostles had to go through these times. In Matthew 7 15 it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly... They are ravening wolves. You know, you've got somebody who acts like somebody they're not. And they might be a really good actor. And everybody says, oh, that's a humble person. That's a very sweet person. But inside they are a ravening wolf. Inside they are rotten. They are profound evil. When we look at chapter 24, verse 11, here in Matthew, chapter 24, verse 11, it says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall look at that, deceive many. Why would people be deceived? Because they didn't know their Bibles. Why would people be deceived? Because they did not take heed to have a close communion with the Holy Spirit. Why would people be deceived? Because there's much disobedience to the Word of God. Those are easy steps for people to fall into being deceived, brethren. But when we look at verse 24 as well, it also warns us and it says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. Look at that. It's not just going to be false prophets, but there's also going to be people, and there have been people in history all over the world that says, Hey, follow me. I'm Christ. Or others who say, Hey, I've come back. And there go the multitude of people that didn't read their Bible. And you know why I say didn't read their Bible? Because in the Bible, those who read the Bible, it actually says when Jesus returns, He's going to return exactly how He left. How did Jesus leave? 
He ascended up into the heavens. So the angels, what did they say? They said, just as you saw him go, you will also see him return. But there go the masses of people following other people who say that they're Christ. Just because they see a few little wonders and, and little things that go on, they go, oh, yes, that's Christ. No, that's not Christ. But there go the masses of people. Deceived. Because they didn't believe it. And look, it also says, and shall show great signs and wonders. So people often go after the signs and the wonders. Oh yes, there's a lot of healing there. There's a lot of anointing there. So that man's a prophet. Or that woman is a Christ. God tells us that we don't go after the signs and wonders. God tells us that we go after the Holy Spirit which confirm, is confirmed in His Word. Because the Holy Spirit has always come to confirm the Word. Jesus said that. Remember? And look at what happens. In so much, they've gone out to deceive in such a way, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Which elect? Those who decided to get slack at their prayer life. Those who decided to get slack at their life of reading the Bible, at obeying the Lord, at congregating, all of those things that God tells us to do. And we're seeing a lot of that today in the world today. So brethren, let us be warned with these scriptures that we are seeing. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1 verse 9. We're looking at a prophet having the precise comprehension of danger of false teaching. Galatians 1 9 says, and we, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So that means that that person has a curse. And we are not to listen to that person who brings another gospel. So what does another gospel sound like? Because, you know, the gospel is supposedly the good news. And what's the good news? Well, the good news is that Jesus Christ came to earth. He was given a human body. He had a ministry of three years and a half. He died on the cross. He rose again on the third day, never to die again. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And his name is now Michael the Archangel. Everyone's going, what? But nobody says anything. <laughs> that last part was heresy. No, his name is not Michael the Archangel. That is false doctrine and false teaching. That came from, you know where? From the pit of hell. But who uses that? The Jehovah's Witness. But people who know the scripture will not be led astray into those things. So when somebody brings a false doctrine, this is what the Bible is saying. If they bring a false gospel, a false good news, that means the one that is not according to the scriptures, then it means that's not the one that's going to take us to heaven. So if it doesn't take us to heaven, that person and anyone who listens to those people are accursed. And that's why it's so important for us to learn the word and know the word. Let's look at 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 verse 12 to 15. 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 verse 12 to 15. You know why I, te you know why I tested you like that, brethren? Because I'm expecting one day that if we put up a preacher here and somebody comes from overseas or somebody comes from somewhere else and somebody gets the pulpit and they preach, what I expect from you out of all this teaching, brethren, is that you at least have the courage to come and, and, and speak to me. And tell me, as the pastor who has given permission for somebody else to preach and say, Did you catch that? They said this and this and this. Now, if I caught on to it, I'll say, Yes, don't worry. We'll correct it soon enough. But if I didn't catch it with my ear, then it needs to be corrected in the church. So that people who might not know scripture don't go away with the lie. They go away with all the truth and how it should be. And that's why... As when we, when we look at the study of the pastor, it's the role of the pastor to correct false doctrines that happen within the church. So, looking at this scripture here, from verse 12 to 15, it says, But what do, what, uh, sorry, but what I do, 
that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Look, so that doesn't end. It's not just that people want to be false prophets. It's also people who call themselves apostles when they're not. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So if the devil dresses up like he's some sort of angel and some sort of good character, look at what he's followers do. It says, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, those who supposedly dress up like they're some sort of, you know, called by God. But it says, ministers also transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You know why? Because they act like one thing, but they actually do something else. So they behave all holy. But in the secret, and when nobody's looking, they're doing their dirty work. So God is saying here that nobody can escape. God will bring out their works and He will judge them accordingly. So even if even if everybody's, you know, might be might be deceived and they might even sort of think of that person as somebody who's a, a holy man or a holy woman or look a devoted person, but God knows who they really are. Amen. Praise be the Lord. But I'll tell you what, why did I read this scripture? I read this scripture because somebody who has the ministry of prophet, of prophecy, who has that, can also discern and receive. Because God also gives a certain gift as well called, you know, the gift of discerning of spirits. That's another gift of the spirit that God gives. It's not ministry, it's a gift, but it's something that is given to someone who has the ministry so that they can serve in ministering. Yeah? To discern what spirit someone is in. Alright, so let's move on. The imminent dependence of the Word of God to confirm the prophet's message. So this is all the characteristics that we see in a prophet, right? We're looking at all the obligations, the desire and the ability of the prophet which allows them to understand. So right now we're looking at the imminent dependence of the Word of God to confirm the prophet's message. Luke chapter 4, verse 17 to 19. Let's look at the scripture there. Praise be the Lord. Luke chapter 4, verse 17 to 19. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. You know, this was Jesus Christ when He was here on earth. He was given the role to read in the book of Isaiah. When He opened it up, He read this, which is a prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. About 700 years before Jesus was here on earth. And 700 years later, that prophecy was being fulfilled at that very moment because Jesus was right there. And that's why when we go to the next verse, it says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And that was Jesus, that Jesus came to fulfill that. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, the scripture also shows us here. For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You know what this is trying to tell us, brethren? Every single thing that Jesus did in His life, and even in His death, was according to the Scriptures. It was already foretold, it was prophesied. You know, in the in the Psalms, in the prophets, everything he did, it was already prophesied. And what this is trying to tell us is that when somebody was a prophet, it's because they're going to fulfill the scriptures. They're going to point the people to the scriptures. So whenever the Holy Spirit of God actually gives a word of prophecy, it's because he's going to point the people 
to something that's in the scriptures. Because Jesus said himself, he says that when the Holy Spirit, the Comforter comes, he will take up what is mine because he will speak of me. He will confirm that Jesus is the living word. Because when Jesus was around, you know what Jesus' task was? He was to confirm the word that was given to him from the Father. So Jesus confirmed that the Father had sent him. The Holy Spirit confirms that Jesus is the Son of God and the way to the Father. So there can't be a prophecy that's outside of the Word. You know, I can't come here and say the Holy Spirit has said that there is a Psalm 151, but it's never been found. So there we go, we're going to add it into the Bible. That would not be prophecy. That would be false prophecy. That would be a false prophet if they claim to be a prophet. You know, I can't keep, come here and, and start, you know, firing off things going, you know, this is going to this, this is going to that. If it's not in the scriptures, if it does not line up with the scriptures. Yes, there are moments where God does get very, uh, you could say, um, in detail, you know. Because you're not going to find the country Australia in the Bible. It doesn't say it, but it does talk in general about all the nations. It does talk about the islands, all right? And you remember, um, I think it might have been a year ago. Hey, you can put this to the test if you want. Remember what I came to say about Habakkuk? And I said, Australia's going to go into war. We're not going to be spared because Australia's not wanted to repent. And look at the war starting over there and all the other countries joining in going, well, what's, what's this, what's that? All right, so you can put that to the test to see if God really spoke to me or not. Now, it hasn't happened here to Australia. But when it happens, and we're, if we're still around, and I'll be like, told you. <laughs> Praise be the Lord. Praise be the name of Jesus. But you know, God's got to do something to restore humbleness in people's hearts again. And the fear of God in people's hearts. Now, I'm not saying I'm a prophet, but I was given a word of prophecy. I was given a word of prophecy. And I was given that biblical verse. And, and not the biblical verse, but the actual book of Habakkuk. And when you read the book of Habakkuk, you'll see what God did. He raised up an army. They came and invaded. They took away captives. They plunged the nation of Jerusalem. Because God had to do something to put the fear of God back in the people and get them to come back to God and drop off their idol, idol worship that they had. And at the same time, you know, God said that He would restore them. But obviously that was going to take some time, right? So anyways, let's continue. When we look at 2 of Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the scripture says to us here, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You see, it didn't just come because it just this, some person decided to write it. It was inspired. People who are God-fearing people, people who have a connection with God, received from the Lord to write it down. And it says, and it's profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And let's look at First of Peter chapter four, verse eleven. Praise be the name of the living God. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So when we minister, brethren, when we get together, you know, our center of attention is Christ. What we choose to exalt and what we need to exalt is Christ. He is the living word. When we praise God and worship His name, we're praising God. We're praising God in Christ. We're praising God through His word. When we come into prayer, we need to be praising God. We need to be serving God. We need to be in prayer with the Lord. We need to be calling on the promises of God. But where's that from? The scriptures. All of that is from His Word, His promises, 
when we sing on to Him, when we minister the Word. Because, you know, it'd be pretty far-fetched if we got together and the least thing we did was talk about Jesus. You know, we talked here and I started making jokes about all sorts of things except naming Jesus. And then when I sing, I sing about other things except what's written in the Word of God. And when I come and I testify something, and I testify anything except what Jesus has done. It'd be pretty far-fetched. That's, that's more like a club, isn't it? Some other club of some other name. But when we get together, we get together for the purpose of exalting Christ. That is the purpose. And we exalt the Word of God. So, let's continue. The message of the prophets are not to be considered infallible. Remember that. The message that prophets give. Somebody who's got a gift and has the ministry, just because they've got a ministry of a prophet, does not mean that everything they say, that the Lord said this and this and this, that we're going to say Amen. Do you say Amen to everything that I say to you? Or do you have to go home and see the scripture and see if those things are the way that I have said they are? Because that's exactly what the Bible tells us we need to do. We need to be like those of Berea. When, you know, those of Berea, when, when Paul went into one of those cities in Macedonia, and he went into a city of Berea, he said, when, when I went to the city of Berea, he goes, those people were very noble. They were so eager to hear the word. But they didn't just stop there. When they went home, they went and confirmed in the scriptures to make sure that what Paul was saying was actually what was according to scripture. And that's what the Bible tells us to do. So this is exactly why when somebody comes and let's just say, for example, give a, give a, a word of prophecy. Or when somebody, let's just say, might have the, the, the ministry of a prophet. It doesn't mean just because their title or because we see that they speak in tongues and then they give a word of prophecy that we're going to believe them straight off the bat. No, we need to analyze what they're saying. Is that according to scripture? Because that's why a lot of people have gone astray as well, brethren. You know? And there's been people who have even believed things that have been so far-fetched as they go, you know, you have a calling to go to Antarctica, for example. And then they go, God has spoken to me. They don't even bother analyzing if it was the Lord who spoke. What are the fruits of the person who's speaking to them? So these are things, brethren, we do not take the words that somebody gives to us as infallible. That means that it doesn't have mistakes. Because we know God doesn't make mistakes, but human beings do make mistakes. Alright? Human beings do make mistakes, but God does not make mistakes. And that is why we do not take the word straight away as it is. We analyze it. And when I talk about analyzing it, it's not just analyzing it through the scripture. It's also analyze it in your spirit. Is God actually touching in your spirit at the time as well? Is he speaking to your spirit as well? So this has to do with our connection with God. Do we really know God? But both of these things help much. So the message of the prophets must be subject to the word of God. This calls for the congregation to discern and test the message given if what it contains be of God. Let me give you an example of that. You know, somebody might rise up and give a message to the whole congregation and say, God is saying this, 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 this. Okay, fair enough. We heard the person. Now it's time that we analyze it. And usually the analyzing work happens, can sometimes happen as the congregation as a whole, but normally it goes to the leadership team who have more discerned and experience in these areas so that they can discern through the scripture what it has been said and if that is according to the Spirit of God. And if we see that it is not according to the Spirit of God, then we don't worry about it. We're not going to come and, you know, crucify the person who gave the false prophecy, no. Because it could be somebody that, you know, maybe they're still developing that skill and they might not have, you know, fully matured in that area. So that means, you know, we might need to help them out a little bit in that area. But in the sense of whether we're going to jump straight to what is being told to us to do, no. We're going to analyze those things first. We're going to see if it's scriptural. 
We're going to see what the Spirit says to us, because the same Spirit of God that dwells in them should be dwelling in us as well. And if it dwells in us, it's going to unite us in the Spirit. It's not going to have us in division. And that's how this works. So let's look at some scripture. 1st of Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29 to 33. We're going to have a look at the gift of prophecy at work here. And certain guidelines that the Apostle Paul set in action so that the church does not go into a disorderly state. But it remains orderly. For example, it says, Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. Hey, you can't judge me. Oh, yes, I can. It says it right there. But this is not a judge to say, this one's going to hell, that one's going to heaven. No, this is judge. It means analyze. Analyze the words that are being said. Analyze how you feel in the spirit about it. Analyze if those words are conforming to the spirit of the Lord and to his word. Because it says, uh, let's just go back please, in verse 29, it says, Let the prophets speak two or three. Now this, when it says the prophets, this is referring to, let's just say, somebody who's got a gift of prophecy, yeah? And if they've got a gift of prophecy and they're firing away a prophecy that's for the church as a whole. So they're just letting, letting that word come out, right? And everybody's hearing them. Sometimes there's a prophecy that's given where somebody goes up to somebody and speaks to them as an individual. And this is why it's important for us to know these things. Because when it's individual, there can be manipulation in between. But when we know the scripture, when we know the word, when we know how to understand the spirit of God, then that won't get in the way either. It'll be exactly like if we heard it publicly as a church, as well as if I'm just hearing it on my own as a person. But there are some measures. It does say that in the service, there'd be two or three at the most. Why? Because, can you imagine that there would be uh, more than that happening in the church? It would start to become disorderly. And I'll explain why. Let's go to the next verse. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. So what's this saying? This is saying that there's not going to be somebody shouting out a prophecy here and somebody else shouting out a prophecy over there for the congregation because then who do we hear? God is not a God of disorder. He's orderly. And you know what God is going to do when somebody has the Spirit of the Lord and this is written because this is what Paul received from God. That means that if somebody is giving a, 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 a word of prophecy for the congregation, then that means that if God's lining up the next one to give a, to, to give a message, then this one, through the Spirit of the Lord, will quiet down. Because then the Spirit of God will be working in the other one. God does not break His rules and His word. Remember that. The Spirit of God does not make the mistakes. We as humans can make mistakes, but God does not make mistakes. So therefore, when that one silences, the other one will speak. And everything gets done orderly so we can hear everything properly that the Spirit of the Lord wants to speak to His church and nothing is missed. And how many would, would be prophesying in the service? Up to three, it says. But any time that one is prophesying, let the other one be silent so that we can hear the message of the other one. And that's what it says. So then, in saying that, what do we then know? If we see two people at the same time giving a word of prophecy, especially if you see one saying one thing and the other one saying the complete opposite, well, we know straight away that that's not from God, don't we? Or we know that one is from the Lord and the other one is a counterfeiter. Because the devil is a good counterfeiter as well, brother. The devil also speaks in tongues. So therefore, that's why we analyze and we take it to the scripture. So let's go to the next verse. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. Because you see, the gift in giving a word of prophecy is not limited to just some people. This is not talking about the ministry. This is just talking about the gift, yet. Yeah? And God can move and stir anyone in the Spirit of the Lord to do that at any given time. But He will do it in His orderly time. And manner. And that's why it says anybody can do that. It's not just going to be a leader. It can be somebody who's, who's also sitting at the chairs. That all may learn and all may be comforted. Verse 32. 
and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So in other words, if somebody has been given a gift of prophecy or somebody speaking in the gift of prophecy, what they say needs to be subject to the prophets that have come beforehand. Which are the prophets that have come beforehand? Well, you find most of them in the Old Testament. All those prophets. So in other words, we're not going to speak something different to what the prophets have already been speaking. I can't speak something different in the end times to what John has already received in the Revelation. You know, I can't come out saying there's eight trumpets that are going to sound when the Revelation already says seven trumpets. Because that would be false. Because it doesn't go with the prophets that have come beforehand. Make sense? And verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So this is across the board, brethren. Every church that says we are a church of God needs to submit to the Word of God. And the Spirit also works confirming Christ, confirming His Word. So He never breaks this. But when we see that something of this is broken, it is because there is something that in the person, the person has made a mistake. The person probably has not matured to understand this. They might, you know, be, be, be receiving something from the Lord, but instead of waiting for the other person who's already prophesying to finish prophesying, they just let it go. So there are errors that are made on the people's behalf, not on God's behalf. And that's why we analyze things. That's why I said to you at the beginning, the, the prophecy is not infallible. Because if we want the ultimate prophecy, the ultimate prophecy is already written down here. Everything else that happens around it has to go through this. If it doesn't pass the check, then just let it go. And that's what we do. We don't worry about it. We just let it go. And when we look at um, first of John chapter 4 verse 1 we are also encouraged by John himself believe me these guys are the ones with the experience already and what did John say he said beloved believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world all right so all I'm saying there is we don't quickly say amen to every single prophecy that moves. We are cautious. We are quick to open our ears and slow to speak. We analyze through the word and if I'm not sure then I take it to prayer. That's really what we need. And you'll be right. Alright, so Prophets are essential in God's plan for the church. Now, see, I'm speaking about the prophets, those who have ministry of the prophet. I am speaking about that directly. Prophets are essential in God's plan for the church. Why is it essential? Because a church which rejects the gift, you know, because there are some churches which proclaim that they believe in Jesus Christ, but they deny the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They say that that was for the time of when, you know, the apostles were around. But then after that, God is not working like that anymore. So that's actually not correct. But there are some churches that teach that way. So what does that mean for us? That means, brethren, that a church that rejects prophets of God will be a backsliding church which will plunge into worldliness and will accommodate the biblical truths to suit what they want instead of what God wants. In other words, if there's nobody that's raising up a concern in the church, can you imagine that, that the church starts to, sin starts to get in the church, in the members of the church, and nobody says anything about it. Everything ends up being okay. There's nobody there with a gift of, you know, being a prophet or the gift of prophecy to bring out sin and say, hey, this is not right before the Lord. Then you know what's going to happen? Then everything becomes okay. Nobody wants to tell anybody else off. Nobody wants to stir up trouble. But look at what the scripture says to us. We'll read it again there in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3. Scripture says to us here. 
But he that prophesies speaks unto men to edification and to exhortation and to comfort. So you know what? God's message to us is not always going to come as you know a comforting message. Sometimes it will come as an exhortation because we need to hear a word of exhortation. Because it means that sometimes you know, we are going astray from the Lord and God wants to bring us back. And how does God do that? He gives us a word of exhortation. And we need to be humble enough or in the spirit of humbleness to be able to receive it if we know that we are going astray. So that's what that means, brethren. When somebody prophesies and speaks that, you know, it comes in those main three areas. I've always said before, the prophecy does not come, brethren, to tell you what to do in your life. That's why we have the Bible. That tells us what to do in our life. You know? The prophecy is not going to come to you and say to you, you, go and buy that house over there and get that land package because it's yours. And then you go off there and you get that land package and then you're like in debt for a thousand years. Why did I listen to that false prophecy? It does not come to direct your life. It comes to warn you in these three areas. You want guidance in your life? Well, you need to get into it with God in prayer, in fasting, in reading His Word, and He will instruct you through His Word what you need to do in your life. See, I don't tell you what to do in your life. I just preach what, what the Lord says in, in the Word. Anybody who has a, a charge or something you know, to serve here, I don't pull people on and say, you must, no. It's your choice if you want to serve God or not. Right? Let's keep looking. Matthew chapter 23, verse 31 to 38. That's Matthew 23, verse 31 to 38. We're almost done, brethren. Looking at this ministry. It says, Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. This was Jesus telling the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, that when they wanted to kill him off, he goes, your witnesses that you people are the ones that kill the prophets. Fill you up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That's some pretty tough words, but Jesus was actually speaking that to the Pharisees, to the Sadducees, and to the, you know, twisted leaders of the time of when he was there. Verse 34, oh yeah, it says, yeah, verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I sent unto you, and then he even said, I'm going to send these to you. I'll send you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge and your, in your synagogues and persecute them for from city to city. You know, that all happened to the church, to the apostles, and all the other people that believed in Jesus, it happened to all of them. Verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barakias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered you, you gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And you know what happened at the year 70 after the death of Jesus and the risen? Jerusalem was invaded by the Roman Empire. They were completely destroyed. The temple was burnt to the ground, just as Jesus said. That's prophecy. It came to pass. Praise the Lord. So, beloved brethren, let's look at Luke chapter 11, verse 49. Luke 11, 49 says to us, Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. You know, sometimes in this case, this is why this ministry of prophecy is one that is a very, you could say, harsh ministry. Because 
You know, even for somebody who preaches the gospel, when we preach the gospel to people, brethren, you know, a pastor or a leader or somebody who preaches, sometimes, you know, what they'll do, it's not sometimes, but every time, what we do is we get into it with God in prayer. We say, God, what is your word for your church? What do you want your church to hear? And you know what happens when God then says, preach about this, and it happens to be sin? Well, what choice do we have? That's what God said for us to do. So then we come to the pulpit and it says, the message for today we're going to preach about is this. Bang. And we start firing away like a, you know, those who do this, those who do that, those who do here, those who do there, they will not inherit the kingdom. And it sounds harsh, but that's prophecy. Because it's revealing what's in the heart, what we need to fix. And the end of the people who do not want to obey God. But if you fix your life before the Lord, then you will be pardoned. And you know, if we don't want to fix our life, that comes on us like a ton of bricks. And we start hating the person in front of God. And he's saying that because of me. We'll wait till we get outside. And all those things start to happen. And then when you're out there going, yeah, I want to talk to you. I know you said that because of me. And they start a problem with you. And you're like, what are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Who who mouthed to, to you? you know, who told you what I've been doing? And then you're like, well, praise the Lord, because God's speaking. I don't know what you're talking about. And there come the threats. There come the hitting. There come, you know, so it's not an easy job sometimes for a leader as well. Sometimes for, you know, a pastor or, or anyone preaching. Because these things also happen on the street. You know, you go out on the street and you... And you, you read a, a quote of the Bible and you say, you know, like the one that we said there, those who are drunkards, those who are this, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But, you know, God loves you very much. He doesn't want you to end up there. He's like, hey, who are you to tell me I'm going to go to hell? Who are you to judge me? And there starts the fight. But you see, it's because they're not willing to leave their life of sin that they get hurt. They're not seeing the fact that God wants to restore them and heal them and help them. And it's not easy, brethren. That's the suffering for the cry for, for Christ's sake. Praise be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's look at what happened to the very first martyr. You remember the first martyr was after Jesus, right? Let's look at Acts chapter 7, verse 51 to 52. You remember Stephen? When Stephen was taken before the council of those so-called religious leaders... Because he was doing miracles in the name of Jesus. He was preaching the name of Jesus. And then God gave him a word of prophecy at that time. Look at what he said. He then said to them, guided by the Holy Spirit, he said to the leaders, the religious leaders, he said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always do resist the Holy Spirit, and your, as your fathers did so, you do as well. And then which of the prophets have you not, your fathers not persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been the betrayers and murderers. So he was just telling them everything that they did. And he was telling them what their forefathers had done in the guidance of the Spirit. But you know what? They couldn't handle his words. So you know what they did? They killed him. They stoned him to death. They ran at him and they put him outside and stoned him to death. So it's not easy, brethren. But if prophets are not allowed to give the message of rebuke, because that's what it is, a message of rebuke so that people can fix their life, a message of rebuke or admonition whilst inspired by the Holy Spirit to bring to light the sin and the injustice often hidden in darkness. If they're not allowed to do that, and usually people who don't allow that to happen is the leadership in the church. So if the leadership stops that and goes, no, we don't want you to be doing that, then you know what happens? The church will convert into a place where the voice of the Spirit will no longer be heard. And ecclesiastic politics and the worldly power will replace the Spirit. So people will start preaching according to the times, according to, you know, what the world says is not sin and what the world says is sin. So we're going to start getting with the times. Because the voice of the Spirit will not be in the church anymore. So what the Bible says is sin is not going to be preached anymore. If people choose to reject the message of the Spirit of God working in people to you know, bring about and, and declare what is sin. And on the contrary, if the church 
and their leaders hear the voice of the prophet. So now we're, let's look at it from the other side. If the church and its leaders hear the voice of the Spirit of God working in the person, then what's going to happen? Then that means that the leaders will hear the voice of the prophet. They will be stimulated to be a church which is renewed in the Spirit and in the communion with Christ whilst abandoning sin and the presence of the Holy Spirit will be evident amongst the faithful. So God will continue to flow through freely in the midst of His church. The church will constantly be helped by the Lord to pick out the sin and cast out the sin. And they will constantly be moving to live a life of righteousness and holiness. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20, 19 to 21. Imagine preaching this on the street, brethren. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, verse 21. Well, actually, no, it wasn't that one. But yes, this is the scripture I want to look at, but it's not. But it's not the um, the one that you know preaching it on the street. But look, it says, "Quench not the spirit." Quench not the spirit is what the scripture tells us to do. So that means we are not to quench. If somebody's made a mistake because of immaturity in the scriptures, let's not quench the spirit in them. Let's help them nurture that gift, but not quench the spirit. Because God may be working in them. But it also says in verse 20, despise not prophesying. Right? There's people that can't handle it anymore because so many false prophecies have been given to them. They're like, no, I'm shutting off to it altogether. They don't want to believe anymore. That's also wrong. It says, despise not prophesying. Because what are we showing? You know, we're showing us an attitude of unbelief. Because then when God does speak to us, we don't believe anything. That we're not even going to believe when God is telling us something. So that's why that's wrong, brethren. We must not despise prophesying. Verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So that's what, that's what the scripture is telling us to do. You know, we hear the person now. We give them the respect as a human being. You know, if they got it wrong and we know they got it wrong, we're not going to go, you're false. Get away from me. Get out of here, false prophet. No, we're not going to do that. We hear things. If we're mature enough to understand that that did not come from God, then we leave it there. We take what was good, what was in Scripture, and the rest that's not, we just leave it there. And if we've identified that they've not done what, you know, they're not moving sort of, like, let's just say, for example, 100% in the Spirit, then we pray for them. Or we go and we speak to the leadership team so that the leadership team can help them as well. And we just leave it there in a spirit of peace. And verse 22 abstain from all appearance of evil. So this is what we are told to do. And now let's finish. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Glory to the Lord. We finally finished the one about the prophet. Hallelujah. But it's necessary so that we go through these things, brethren, because we never know what God will do with the church. Or we never know, you know, if we end up having a church service with another church, and there might be people there. Or we never know if there could be visitors in future. We never know. But as long as we know the scripture, the truth, then we will know what to measure, what to do, what to not do. Not to offend. All of these things, brethren. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. For sometimes there are people that they want to come and give you a word of prophecy, but you've already looked at their fruits. You've already seen their actions. You've already judged their words. And when you see that it's a person you know, whose mouth is always lying, it's like, well, excuse me, but the Spirit of God is holy. He's not going to come and give me a word of prophecy in the mouth of some liar. Because I know that when God is going to use somebody, He's going to fix them up first. He's going to deal with their characteristic first. Before He gives them a gift of that sort. You know why? Because if God doesn't deal with the inside character of the person, let's just say, for example, if the person has pride, ego, well then, if they were given a gift of God before the time, what's going to happen to their pride? What's going to happen to their ego? Well, that's not going to help them, is it? 
So God has to make sure first that their spirit is crushed to the ground, that it's not them but Christ in them, that the spirit of the, the fruit of the spirit is flowing through them, so that when God does deposit and give a gift of the spirit or a ministry, that they're going to minister in that gift in the fruit of the spirit, not in you know pridefulness, not in greed for money. Like many people, you know, they're like, they're like, oh, you know, you want me to give a prophecy? Well, you got to give me 50 bucks first and I'll get it. And they make a business out of something that God has given for free. So that's the difference, really. And that's why when somebody knows the scripture and knows how to read somebody and the fruit of the spirit, of what we should be seeing in somebody, we don't straight away say amen. We analyze, we pray. If it's of the Lord, we take it. If it's not of the Lord, we don't take it. But if we see the fruits of that person that is more of a carnal person, a worldly person, then they don't expect me to receive a prophecy of somebody in that state, brethren. Because the scripture is very, very clear how the person needs to be firstly fixed up on the inside and fixed up on the outside as well, brethren. And God does not make mistakes. Humans do. God does not. You know, sometimes there are people that, yes, they might not have been taught the scripture because they might have been in the church but they, they weren't taught properly. So they got maybe a few things to fix. It wasn't their fault. That's fine. But when we're talking about somebody who's in a leadership role, calling themselves a pastor or a leader of some form, and they're still walking twistedly and supposedly have gifts of the Spirit, I would be more inclined to analyze the fruits first before I see what manifestations come. And I don't care if there's healing and miracles. I look at the fruits first, because I need to see if Christ is there first, before I see the work of the Spirit first. Because it's got to be Christ in there, and the Spirit of God will flow. Not the devil in there, and we're seeing the Spirit flow. That doesn't work that way. The Spirit of God does not flow in a devil. It flows in somebody who has the characteristics of Christ. But if you're seeing miracles and wonders and signs and all those sorts of things, and you're seeing corruption in somebody, then more or less, the Bible also does tell us that Satan's ministers dress up like a minister of light, but their deeds, their works are evil. You know? You ever had that feeling when you look at somebody and you're like, it appears Christian, but something... You know, and, and you get that sort of like, huh? You know what that huh is? You're confused about that person. The spirit is sort of not connecting there. You know why? Because yeah, that's right, it doesn't add up. It appears to be something like Christian, but there's something wrong about it. And more or less, when we analyze it, if it's not matching up with the scripture, then don't worry about it. If it stinks, it stinks. Yeah? That's probably the easiest way I can put it. If it stinks, then don't try and, you know, don't try and get around that saying it doesn't stink. If it stinks, it stinks. But if it's the Spirit of God, then He will confirm with your spirit that it is God that is talking. That it is God who is working. That it is God who is speaking to you. That it is God. You know? And God doesn't make mistakes. So, brethren, we've come to the end of that study of the ministry of the prophet.